If you traveled to a remote part of the Amazon rainforest where there is a native group that's been pretty much untouched by modern society, I mean, there's no airports that go there. You would have to travel down river for a couple of days, actually. And then after that, you would have to trek through the jungle for a couple of days. And if you finally got to this native group of people, what you'd find is this, a society that's pretty much untouched by modern culture, except for there's a church there. See, the missionaries years ago took that trip. And because they took that trip, there's now a church there. There's a pastor who's a native who preaches the gospel in their native language. They've got Bibles. And if you happen to come across that church in the corner, you would find an organ collecting dust. Nobody in this native group knows how to play the organ. They worship God with their instruments. But someone said, there's a church, there's got to be an organ. <laughs> so what happened was, think about this, somebody put that organ on that boat and went downriver, and then somebody carried that organ through the forest for days, and they gave it to the people. And the people are grateful. They don't know how to use it, though. It just sits there. See, there are certain things that we believe have to happen in a church. Now, I'm not picking on organs. That just kind of tells you how long ago that church was planted, right? If we did it in our modern society, we might say it's got to have a, a drum kit or it's got to have projectors, right? Because we believe that churches have to have something. So what does a church have to have? Does it have to have seats so you can sit? Or could we stand the whole time? Does it have to have instruments that are live? Or could we worship from the projector? Could we do it a cappella? Does it have to have stained glass windows and pews? We've got that over there at the chapel. A lot of people like that chapel. I've um, hosted some uh, local pastors in Orange, and they come to the chapel, and they go, wow, this is amazing. What do you do here? I say, I don't know. We don't do anything in here. <laughs> people drive by and want to get married in it. I don't know. But so, so we all have ideas of what a church has to have. Someone thought that church had to have an organ. Well, I'll tell you, and you probably know this, the church isn't the stuff, it's the people, right? You are the church. You are the church. And, and, and the things you have to have are characteristics of a church. And God's told us what those are. And so I believe a couple of those characteristics are found here in the Philippians book. I believe that a church is marked by a couple of things. Those things are unity and humility. The church is marked by unity and humility. We're in a series called Radical Joy. And this is the fourth week of that series. We're studying the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. Paul, the apostle and church planner, planted this church 10 years previously. And now he's imprisoned. And while he was imprisoned, the Philippian church that he planted 10 years ago, they sent him um, a care package, if you will, and an offering. And he was so grateful that they remembered him, right? And he was so grateful that they, they cared enough to send him that, that he's writing a thank you letter. And in the midst of writing the letter, he's sharing wisdom. He's still a pastor. He's still sharing hope from the Word. And so he's sharing God's message in the same way that an incarcerated pastor would these days. You know, there's places all over the world where you go to jail for being a Christian. And so when those pastors write to their congregation, they share encouragement. And that's what Paul's doing. And so we're in the fourth week of this series. If, if you don't have a Bible, um, we'd love to put a Bible in your hands, but now's the time to get that out. If you don't have a Bible, but you have a phone, they have apps for that now, right? Um, if you want a Bible, raise your hand. We'd love to give you one. Um, you can keep this Bible. This will be your Bible. If you don't have one, we'd love for you to read it. We're going to put the scriptures on the screen. Um, but as you know, these screens will go out. <laughs> they're just, they're finicky, right? They will go out, but your Bible will stay in your hands. So I encourage you all to have your own, your own word of God. We finished chapter one last week. And at the end of chapter one, Paul said, you know what? I would much rather be in heaven with Jesus, which is something that we've probably felt. But he said, but while I'm here, I'm so dedicated to serving you, to his church. And so, so he said, 
it's better to be in heaven with Jesus, but while I'm here, I'm determined to finish. And that's where we left off last week. So open with me to Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2, and we'll get into this, this week's lesson. Verses 2, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now what we'll, ha- what we'll see is, in the days of this letter, this is about 62 AD at this point, there were divisions in the church. In fact, in chapter 1, there were people, if you remember, who were trying to hurt Paul by sharing the gospel. They were trying to harm him, and he said, I don't care. As long as the gospel is shared, I don't care if they hurt me. And, and if you go into chapter 4, uh, we'll preach on this later, there's actually division in the church. Division in the church? Can that really happen? Hmm. That was sarcasm, sorry. I wasn't good at that. But Paul is telling them, division's not good for a church. You have to be united. And that's my encouragement for you. So let's do this together. Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2. Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2. And we're looking for Paul's words to be united. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Intent on one purpose. See, disunity is not new, right? Conflict is not new. Division is not new. It's one of Satan's oldest tricks. If you ever find yourself reading through Genesis, his, his, the trick that he used on Adam, Genesis 3, was simply a question. Did God really say? Did God really say? Questioning God's goodness and breaking the unity between God and man right there. And Satan continues to do that same trick to this day. Did God really say? Did the pastor really say? Did the elders really say? Did your small group leader really say? Feeding our distrust and causing disunity. But Paul's telling us to be united. Simple enough, right? We've seen what disunity can do throughout history to an organization. I mean, look at our nation now. It's probably one of the most divided times ever. And we would love to have unity now. The church? What's the church look like? Are we a united church? So Paul is saying, be united. So here, I'm telling you, be united. Easy enough, right? Donuts? Donuts and lunch now? No, it's actually, there's a little bit more to it than that. So... So, so lucky for us, it's not easy to just be united. So Paul gives us like a recipe to follow to how we can s- seek to be a united church. And he says this. He says, be united by a mutual love of God, be united by the Spirit of God, and be united by a common purpose. By a common purpose. Don't worry if you don't get all these at once. I'm going to go through them slowly. Okay, I know some of you guys just have to write every word down, right? But we're going to go through this. But Paul is saying this is how you can be a united church. All right? The first thing he says is be united by a mutual love of God. The word love that he uses there is agape. How many have ever heard that Greek word, agape? It's a, it's a, it's a special kind of love. It's sacrificial love. It's a love that looks out for the best in others. You know, there's a, there's a portion of uh, Corinthians where Paul says, you know, I want what's best for them. So if I don't eat meat and that's best for you, okay. And we call that loving others with our freedoms, right? And so agape is shown through Jesus. Jesus exhibited this sacrificial love while he was on the cross. And we see that word in John 15, 13. John 15, 13, when Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. So Paul says that we are united by this mutual, sacrificial love. This love that was first expressed from God to us, and now we will express it to each other in the church. And I think that's a uniting thing, don't you? If we can do it. If we can do it. But we must be united by the mutual love of God. So what's the next thing he says? He says that we should not only be united by the mutual love of God, but we must be united by the Holy Spirit. 
by the Holy Spirit. Looking at that, those verses again, 1 and 2. If there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, any com- affection and compassion. He says, if there is any, any affection by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Spirit of God. It was given to the apostles in Acts, and now it lives in every Christian believer. And it's at work in you and I. And Paul is saying that Spirit that works in us will be the same thing that guides us. This, and he's saying the word if in that verse. He says if. If any affection and compassion. And he's not saying like it might exist or it might not, right? What he's saying is, show me. He's saying, show me. Any of you ever uh, done athletics or had a coach or any type of thing in that role, yeah? Yeah? And coaches will say things to motivate you, right? So imagine you are in, um, you're, you're in the last quarter of a basketball game. You are in the last round of a boxing match. You are in the last heat of a swim meet. And, and your coach says, I know you have this in you. I know you can do this. Show me. Show me what I've taught you. Show me what you have in you. And that's what Paul is saying here. You've got the Holy Spirit. We've all got him. He is guiding us. Now show me that he's in work in you by being united and working together. What about us? Do we have what it takes to show the world? Do we have what it takes to show the world what it looks like to be a united church empowered by God's Holy Spirit? We must be united. How else? How else can we be a united church? Well, the next thing he says here is we are united by a common purpose. We're united by a common purpose. What's the purpose of the church? What's the purpose of the church? We, there are tons of great things that a church does. But I would say that those are um, 1A, 1B, and 1C. And I think there's one real purpose to a church. Is it to, um, to minister in the community? Oh, I think that's good. Is it to educate and edify um, the people, the Christians? Oh, I hope so. I hope that. That's good too, right? Is it for social and moral reform? I hope we're influencing that. Is it to share the gospel? Yeah, sure. But I would argue that that's not the main point of the church. I would argue that the church exists for one reason. And when we can get on that one purpose of the church all on the same page, there can be unity there as we all go in the same direction. I won't make you turn there, but I'll have you write it down. Revelation 4 and 5. Revelation 4 and 5 is John's prophetic vision of what the future will look like. And there's a church in heaven. There's a church service in heaven. And as you read through Revelation 4 and 5, you'll see that there are people gathered around the throne of Jesus and they are worshiping Him forever, declaring His holiness, His worthiness, casting their crowns, which represents their earthly value, on the feet of of Jesus, and they do this forever. I think that's the point of the church. I think the Bible teaches us that the point of the church is to worship God. It's to bring glory to God. It's to to worship God forever. So the church is all about worshiping God. And all the things that we do as a result, those are happy side effects. Those are 1B, 1C, 1D. Those are sub points. So you growing in your faith, that's a side effect of our worship of God together. Us reaching the community for Jesus, that's a side effect of us worshiping God together. But if we're all on the purpose of worshiping God, if we're all unified on the purpose of worshiping worshiping God, then we, as a church, can come together on that one issue. And we can be united. Especially when everybody thinks we should be doing something. Right? There's the illustration of the the horses going in separate directions. So the church... The church, you, you are very um, motivated people. You can do a lot, right? So it's similar to a horse carriage. Horse carriage with four horses can go for miles, right? Those four horses can pull the carriage. They can do a great job if they're all going in the same direction. 
But if we all go in different directions, no, the church should be doing this, the church should be doing this, the church should be doing this. God told me the church should be doing this. And we're pulling in separate directions. Well, there's no unity there, is there? And we're confused on our mission. And we're upset at each other. You're not doing what the church should do. Let's remember the purpose. The church exists to worship God forever. And one day that's what we'll do. One day we will be there and that's what we will do. We will worship God forever. Be united. God can use a united church. If we're not working together for one common purpose, God might use us, but it's kind of like matter of fact. You know? It's like, when I, was, when I was playing high school football, I wasn't good at it. When I was playing high school football, I separated my shoulder really bad, right? And God used that to get me out of athletics, to get me into a speech program, the speech and debate team, right? He used that injury to do that, but it, it, it was never the way I wanted it to work. That's the same way it would be if he used us in our disunity, If we're not unified, sure, he can use us, but it's not the way we want it to go. But if we're a unified church, God can use us. So we should be united. We should be united for a common purpose. But by the mutual love of God, united by the Holy Spirit that lives with us, and united by a common purpose. So what does it look like? What does that look like when we put that into practice? Well, Paul tells us in the next portion of Scripture here in verses 3 and 4, that it looks like humility. So let's read. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. I'm not going to talk about this too much. I feel like Paul's been kind of putting it in every portion of this letter, and so this will be the third time that we talk about it the sacrificial attitude that a Christian should have. I won't talk about too much, but I will say this. Christian character is marked by putting others above us. It's counter-cultural. It's counter-intuitive. But it is one of the hallmarks of the gospel. Putting others above us. The great thing about a church is you don't have to clean yourself up before you come here. You come here with baggage and all, right? And so we come here and and, and we meet God here and we bring our baggage here and God, by His Spirit, is He's making us more like His Son. He's healing us. That's what we talked about in the first sermon, week one. He's healing us. The problem is, sometimes, our baggage hits up against other people in the church's baggage, right? Right? baggage fire. I don't know what to call that, right? Baggage wars. Or sometimes our baggage meets where God is growing us and sanctifying us, and they meet head on. And we're not where we want to be. We're not what we should be. We know there's something wrong, but there's still all this baggage that we're carrying along. And so that makes something like humility hard. Personal humility and humility as a church, right? Because we carry these insecurities, I'm supposed to put other people first, but if I don't put myself first, who's going to put me first, right? And so out of our insecurities, we we make ourselves known, we, we make ourselves louder, and our society feeds off of it. We have this shared narcissism, right? We just, me, 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 me. And God is saying that's not new. The people in Philippi and Rome, same thing all about them, all about them. And he's saying that's not new and that's not the way it's supposed to be. The gospel message is you put others above yourself. But if I put others above myself, who is going to make much of me? Who is going to lift me up? Who is going to do that? That's what our insecurity says, right? Well, the Bible tells us that God has done it. Let me tell you something. When God sent his son to die for your sins, that is an amazing act of love. That is an amazing confirmation of your value to him, 
Right? You don't need to lift yourself up. God has already done it. And so we're people who've been changed by that. We know that. We reflect that. God's already lifted me. I don't need to, I don't need to do that. Let me, let me put others before me. Because God's made much of me. And I know my insecurities are telling me, no, no, I gotta, but I've got to be counterintuitive right now. I've got to trust in the gospel that God is the one who, who will lift me up. So how do we apply this humility this week? Because otherwise, if we don't have application, it's just info, right? So this is what I want us to do. We are, Paul's talking to the context of a church. So this week, find a way to put someone else in your church before you. Before you. That's it. Find at least one way. How can I live humbly to someone else in my church body? I'm going to put their needs and their desires before my own. And that's counterintuitive to 2019. If you drive on the freeway, you know that's counterintuitive. We basically do what we want, when we want, as we cruise at each other in 90 mile per hour missiles, right? But let's do it in the church. It could be as simple as you guys reach for the same donut, you take the donut. Instead of my donut, I need that donut. That's all that thing. It's my value in that donut, right? Like, it could be as simple as when you dart out of here and your 90 mile per hour missile, right? Out of the parking lot, you let somebody else go, right? Could be simple. Could be huge. Could be, you know, I've been planning this trip. It's something extra I don't really need. But I'm going to, I know this person's struggling with debt in the church, in my small group, and I want to help them with that. Could be big. But you can make this humility real this week, okay? So that's your application. This week, do that. Because the church is humble. That's one of the marks of the church. Is this easy? No, it's hard, right? And I stand up here and go, do it. It's easier said than done. Would it be helpful if we had an example? Yes, Edmund. Thank you. Thankfully, Paul gave us an example. And it's not a surprise. The example is Jesus. So the last thing we see here is that we should be like Jesus. We should be like Jesus, who showed us the example of unity and showed us the example of humility. Let's finish here, 5 through 11. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Paul is going to get into a deep theological poem here. He's going, to, he's going to use essences of Isaiah, the suffering servant. He's going to talk about Genesis, Adam, and he's going to do it so succinctly and so beautifully that we can't even get it right in the English language. But we'll try. We'll try. So Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let's, let's get here. So he says, Be united, be humble, and have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We read that, and it sounds like a lot of churchinese, right? A lot of church words in there. But to the Roman reading that, that was scandalous. That was TMZ material. That was, whoa, what did you just say? Death on a cross, the crucifixion, is one of the most humiliating ways to die in the Roman culture. The fact that Jesus died on a cross is what made people doubt that he was the Son of God. You mean the Son of God died in the same way that a slave does in that culture? Scandalous. The pattern of attaining the self-exaltation was well known to a Roman citizen. I mean, look at history. Look at their emperor at the time, Nero, right? Look, look, at, look at how everybody exalted themselves. But, but the way Jesus did it to humble himself, scandalous. It's not how we do things in Rome. And then there's the polar opposites here. The cross would have been the end of this foolish religion. 
Yet Paul states that it's the solidifying event of the faith. The description of Jesus attaining power was the opposite way that an emperor came into power. He was humbled, humiliated, then exalted by God. Paul is pressing against the comfortability of his readers. He's saying, Jesus used this humility that we're supposed to echo, that flies in the face of our natural culture here, and that's, that's what we should do too. This is messy. This is not clean. This is scandalous. And it's not socially acceptable. And Paul is saying, this is how Jesus did it. So let's analyze some of these scriptures together because they're, they're really good. So verse 6 Philippians verse 2, 6 said, He existed in the form of God and didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He, he, he existed with God before the foundation of the world. This is Jesus' preexistence for you scholarly types. This is the preexistence of Jesus, and you can find this in John 1, 1. John 1, 1 talks about this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word obviously being Jesus, the Son of God. Let's look at this again. Um, verse 2 7 says, But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Bondservant. The bondservant, the doulos in the Greek, was not something you attained to God. It was a, slur, it was a slave servant. And they were low on the totem pole in the culture. And, 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 and the, the reference to Jesus as bondservant was only used in the this, in this Scripture in Philippians. Paul, if you ever read his letters, happily calls himself a bondservant of Jesus. But he said, Jesus became a servant of men. The humility there. And we see this in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Jesus humbling himself for the sake of humanity. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty might become rich. There in verse 7 again, there is a reference to Adam and his disobedience and Jesus' obedience. When it says he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Romans 5.19 talks about this. When he says, for as through one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, that many will be made righteous. Have you guys ever wondered what the gospel message was? You have a good, succinct gospel message right here in verses 5 through 11. What Jesus did for us. What Adam failed to do, Jesus did. And it was humiliating. And it was not the way that people in the high society did it. It's not the way that the Son of God was supposed to do it. Paul then talks about some prophetic things that will happen here in verses 9 through 11. In verses 9 through 11, he says again, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, of glo- uh, Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Lord. We say that here. Jesus is Lord. Right? That's something that we say happily. But here we, we read a prophecy that says that every, there'll be a day when everyone says that. You and I will declare it happily as we, we know this and we've realized this early on and we live it out. And for people who don't believe, they will declare it out of their realization in their shame. I didn't know this, but I will say it anyways because it's true. On earth, heaven, under the earth, the dead, everybody. And Paul says this is our example. This is our example of humility. You want unity? I'll show you unity, Paul says. God's son following through with the plan for redemption that led to death. That's unity. You want humility? I'll show you humility. God's son says, I'll become a human to die by the hands of sinful humans on an embarrassing, humiliating cross to save sinful humans. 
That's humility. And the church is supposed to be identified by this radical humility. Jesus is our example. Jesus is our example. We all learn to swim in different ways, right? There's different ways, different schools of thought. Some people just get thrown in, right? And if you can get to the edge, you made it. Some parents will jump in the water first, right? And they jump in the water, and and then they, they start wading, and they look without panic at their child, and they say, it's okay, right? Like, no sharks, right? I'm swimming, I'm floating, it's not dangerous, I've done it, you can do it, right? And they're instilling confidence in their child. Jesus is doing that with his example. He says, I've done it. I know it looks scary. I know it looks daunting, but it's okay. I've done it, and you can do it. Because we are called to the same thing. We are called to be like Jesus. The call to be united and humble seems daunting, but Jesus showed us the way, and we're supposed to follow it. We're often called the followers of Jesus because we believe, but now we're literally supposed to follow his example and be humble in the same way. So the last point again is be like Jesus. He's the example of unity and humility. You're the church. You are the legacy. You are what Jesus was talking about when he said to Peter that I will build my church and the gates of hell itself will not prevail against it. You are the legacy of Roman persecution, of whole families being fed to wild animals in the stadium for entertainment. And they knew that there was something bigger than them happening at that moment. You're the church. You're the legacy of the current persecuted people around the world. The people who this week will trust in Jesus Christ and know that when they do that, they will take their faith and their life into their own hands where they may be killed for what they believe, possibly by their own family. You're the church. You're the ones who will cast your crowns at the feet of Jesus for an eternity to proclaim his worthiness. With that in mind, with this perspective, let's live united in love. Let's live by the Spirit. And let's be united with one purpose. Let's also live with humility. And let's live like Jesus. You can do this, North Orange. You have the example of Jesus Christ to follow, and you have God's Spirit living in you to guide you. So do it this week. Amen? Amen.